Um, welcome again to CSIS's inaugural Global Development Forum. My name is Connor Savoy. I am the Deputy Director of the Project on U.S. Leadership and Development here at CSIS. Uh, today's breakout session is on innovative financing mechanisms for development, um, our contribution to the evolving discussion around how to finance development. Uh, this is an important and timely conversation as the UN will convene the Financing for Development Conference in Addis Ababa later this summer. Uh, this follows on two earlier conferences, one in Monterey in 2002 and Doha in 2008. Uh, clearly, how to pay for the post-2015 sustainable development goals will be front and center uh, at Addis. By at least one measure, achieving this new set of goals could cost somewhere up to $4 trillion. Um, we have a great panel here today to discuss these issues. Joining me are uh, left to right, Mildred Kalir, Vice President for Financial and Portfolio Management at the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, Julie Katzman, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, Charles Moser, uh, Managing Director for Latin America Capital Markets at Morgan Stanley, and finally, Edie Quantrill, Director of the Operations Group at the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency. So welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, before I turn to the panel, I did want to put out <coughs> three data points that I think frame uh, what we're looking at for the financing for development conversation. Um, the first is about the changing nature of financial flows from the developed world to the developing world. Uh, in 1960, approximately 70% of all U.S. financial flows were public, and about 30% of it was private. Um, that figure is now flipped, with about 90% being public, or private rather, and 10% being public. Um, in 2012, foreign direct investment to the developing world surpassed FDI to the developed world for the first time. Um, and finally, in terms of the domestic resources that are available, you've seen a massive increase in what developing countries have available to them. So for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, you saw uh, domestic resources rise from around $100 billion in 2000 to just over $530 billion in 2012. And if you compare that to o ODA, Official Development Assistance, that went from about 20 billion to 54 billion. So you see an order of 10 times the magnitude of domestic resources vis-a-vis -vis foreign assistance. Um, let's turn to the panel. Uh, thanks again to all of you for being here today. Uh, Julie, I thought we'd start with you. Um, you're at the IDB. The IDB recently reorganized its private sector operations. You're former director of the Multilateral Investment Fund. Can you explain why the IDB decided to reorg um, and how you plan to use these resources to support the private sector? Thanks, Connor. And, and I agree. I mean, I think this conversation is very timely because we've spent most of last week or last weekend, if you were involved in any of the World Bank or IMF meetings, talking about what is that financing gap to try to achieve the SDGs. And you used four trillion. Uh, UNCTAD has two and a half trillion. Some people have six trillion. You know, it's it's an it's unknown, but it's big. It's right. Big. What we know is it's big. And, and it's big, and it's big in the context of the, the primary multilateral uh, development banks lending last year order of magnitude 100, 120 billion dollars, change the first letter. So there's, there's clearly a gap that has to be financed, and it's a big one. And if you look at most of the MDBs, most of them are, in one way or another, up against a financial constraint largely from their balance sheets. Um, and so we, like the others, are looking at various ways to address, first and foremost, those financing and financial constraints. And in a, in a bunch of ways. So the Asia Development Bank getting approval to combine the Asia Development Bank and the Asia Development Fund is going to create capital for them, which will allow them to increase their lending. Um, we and some of the others are in the midst of working on uh, exposure exchange agreements, which addresses the rating agency issue for many of us on concentration risk. So if you know, we only have 26 countries we can lend to, that's it, and only you know, three of them are very large economies, so you end up with heavily concentrated portfolios. And there's a whole issue around this methodology, but that's the methodology that the rating agencies use. So the result is, you know, we need to cha exchange some of those for other countries in the world and change that mix and create higher capital ratios for rating possibilities. 
So we're doing those kinds of things. And, and then let's talk a little bit about what we were calling the NUCO. Um, in 1999, uh, the IDB first thought about taking all of the private sector operations and putting them in one institution. We today have the IDB itself, the bank, and we have the Inter-American Investment Corporation, the IIC, which is a separate entity and focuses solely on the private sector, but it only does <coughs> small and medium-sized enterprises. <coughs> Large deals, as well as small deals, were done in the bank, and then the third part of the private sector was another separate entity that's sort of the grant-making arm. If I tried to explain all this to you, you would leave before I got to the end. <laughs> and that's the problem for clients, right? So there was a lot of redundancy. It was very hard to explain. It's really hard to leverage resources when people can't figure out your structure. So that's what they began in 1999. You know, I think there's an overlay of all this, that there's a little bit of a mismatch today between the ambition of the SDGs and the ambitions for the MDBs, with A, our financial resources, and B, our governance. And this is a story, of, in a way, about that governance, because it took from 1999 till March to get an agreement to put all those private sector entities into one group. This time around, it took two years. And it took two years, and the result of that is that over the next seven years, shareholders will put $1.3 billion of fresh capital into the private sector entity, and the bank will transfer approximately $700 million of its resources into that entity um, for $2 billion. What, what I would say is that we believe that that's going to allow us to very cleanly hone the mission of that private sector entity. And there is no question that if we're going to, countries are going to be able to get to the numbers, and we as a global community are going to be able to get to the numbers to achieve the SDGs, the private sector has a big role to play, but they can't play that <coughs> role by themselves without grant money, without ODA, lots of things that the private sector might do, they're not going to do, they won't be able to do. Without the MDBs, there are many things that the private sector could do or would do that they won't be able to do. And so being able to create a single entity with a very clear focus, which relooks its own processes, becomes more efficient and, and flexible and agile while still maintaining all the safeguards, I think is a key ingredient to this. And that was really the thinking behind it. I will say that the other piece of this is there is often criticism about private sector focused development institutions that they're not developmental enough. And we, from the very beginning of this, said that is the core of what we are doing. And we were very focused on that development mission. And I feel very good about the way in which we have conceived of this. Uh, and how we believe it will roll out. And in the period of time that we've been working on this, you can already see the increased, let's say, development content within the private sector transactions that we've been doing. That's great. Thanks, Julie. That was really very good. Charles, turning to you, um, you have a background in capital markets in Latin America. Uh, I think you've seen a, very much a growing interest recently in emerging mar market debt. Some folks feel this is chasing yields. Uh, with the low yields you're seeing in more traditional bond markets. Um, can you discuss how the debt markets in Latin America have changed since your career started? Do you see what's happening right now is simply chasing yields? I know you wanted to talk a bit about the, the Brady bond evolution, so maybe we can Yeah, start. I actually started out, um, my first job, my first major job in Latin America was restructuring debt, and that was the big growing area in Latin America if you had started in the 80s or 90s. And the problem was um, a situation where, as there is now, there was an excess at that time of petrodollars looking for a place to go. And they were channeled largely through uh, the banking system. And the banking system was set up to make five-year dollar loans. And they were kind of balance of payment dollar loans. And those loans uh, uh, very quickly went south when, or, or, or started to lose value and, and, and default when first it was the oil producers that uh, had a decline in their oil prices. And then when they started to default, since the banks had concentrations in Latin America, they stopped lending. And that meant no one could roll over. And everyone was counting on new loans. And that led to a whole restructuring situation. But it actually was a very, it, it led, after probably 10 years of, 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 of constant restructuring, to an innovation that I think has taken the market a lot 
further than anyone ever expected it to go. So we went from having a situation where we had a lot of dollar loans um, and to a, you know, largely you know, the six or seven champion countries in the region um, to a situation where the banks decided that it was no longer sustainable. And I think it, it, because we were going through our third or fourth restructure, every restructure was bleeding the financial institutions further. Uh, banks were, uh, I worked at Citibank at the time and our capitalization was under 4%, so we were very close to insolvency. And if we had written down to market value the loans that we had, it probably would have led to uh, negative numbers. So um, there was a decision taken, I think it was a visionary decision by Secretary Brady, of proposing these bonds that were uh, offered a number of advantages. So instead of having a relationship between a bank and a sovereign borrower, um, we decided to make the uh, creditor an, uh, anonymous and therefore much harder to deal with, much harder to force into rollovers every three or four years. And so uh, the banks agreed then, or they exchanged what they had in bank debt for bond debt. But well, there, were all, there were some incentives thrown in there too. There were, uh, uh, banks were given the opportunity of recovering what they wrote down if, 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 if values went back up, if the countries recovered. So, in Mexico's case, we worked on oil warrants. You may be familiar with uh, Argentina has GDP warrants, for example. So there are a number of different uh, systems or, or mechanisms that were put in place to induce the banks to, to uh, take the switch. And what, what that created was the first kind of liquid bond market. And the liquid bond market has brought a number of benefits to uh, development financing in the region. Um, and has, in essence, provided a far lower cost, more efficient, and better suited source of financing than bank loans ever were. So you can see a situation now where virtually any country in the region can borrow for 30 years. Mexico borrows for 100 years, Peru's done 40 years, Panama's done 50 years, and in size. I mean, in Latin America, just last year, saw over $180 billion of bond financing taking place. So, there's a tremendous amount of money, and part of it is this liquidity. But we had the same liquidity and the same phenomenon before with the petrodollars. Yeah. It's just that it's, 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 it's flowing in a much more efficient way. Um, banks, you know, there were 10 money center banks in the US back then, and they were the lenders. And so lending was largely concentrated. So any one of us was systemically important. And it, 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 you know, if any bank got into trouble, the lending to the region pretty much seized up. Now, we just did last year, uh, a consent solicitation for Femex, and what that allows us to do is see the entire universe of bondholders. So Femex has over a thousand institutions that hold their bonds today that we needed to vote on this consent. So it, it pulverized the ownership a lot further. Um, we're beginning to see lending in local currency. So the, the original sin, as it was called back then, was to that, that people would lend in dollars to entities that generally could only generate uh, revenues in local currency. And so eventually these things all blew up. Uh, my first restructures were like beer companies in Mexico or steel producers in Mexico that were earning local currency but had dollar obligations. So as soon as the currency devalued, they were in very serious trouble. So Mexico, for example, funds 70% of the long-term bonds issued out of Mexico today in pesos are owned by foreigners. Foreigners buy them. We've raised for Peru over $5 billion in solace in the last two, three years. Um, and that, and, and most of the countries that, are, are, that have caught on to this are actually migrating their balance sheets as quickly as they can from dollar debt to local currency debt. And, um, and that's working very well. And what we see going forward is a further evolution of the bond market where we're beginning to do bonds that are in local currency for projects or for companies. So Morgan Stanley, for example, has been focused the last three or four years in developing Mexican corporate bonds that actually trade on Euroclear. And so what that means is that, you know, there's a proverbial Belgian dentist that we used to talk about that used to give his money to a bank, the bank lent dollars into Mexico. Well now, that same retail investor has the opportunity to buy into, you know, a road project in Mexico or, you know, a hydro, uh, not a hydro, I'm sorry, um, uh, wind, uh, wind project in, in Paraguay, or, or, and they can do it in dollars or they can do it in local currencies, and they have much better information, because when we do an international bond, we have to provide a fair amount of information, an average prospectus, probably two, 300 pages, so. Um, 
it's in local currency, which means it's less likely to default because it's, in the, it's, 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 it's a matched uh, obligation as opposed to an obligation of currency that's different from the one in which they earn uh, the revenues. It's liquid because we trade them on international markets. And it's in a market that has a lot more participants and participants with different priorities. So we have local investors, you know, local pension funds, and then we have international pension funds. And what we found is that when we had our panic in 2008, 2009, where all the internationals were selling, the locals just bought it up because they got it. And that reduced the volatility of the prices. And so we have, I think, today a far more efficient, and it's all, you know, really the product of, of, of product innovation that came from these Brady Mons, but we have a far more efficient conduit now to provide long-term local currency financing for development uh, to the region than we did, say, uh, 25 years ago. Great. Thanks, Charles. That's very interesting. Um, Mildred, you've had a long career at OPIC, starting as a child prodigy, no doubt. Um, <laughs> How has OPIC tried to be innovative in its approach to providing development finance? It's the US government's development finance institution, so it has a development mission, but also has this over, broader overlay of US foreign policy goals. So you know, in addition to the innova innovation in its approach, how are you reacting to emerging opportunities or challenges around the world? Great. And I, and I think, you know, a lot of uh, good launching off points, yeah. both from your opening remarks and from my fellow panelists here. And, and, and I do want to talk about the, the different ways in which OPIC uh, financing is moving into some, some new uh, innovative areas. But I, I, I think it's, it's worth, um, you know, stepping back to the, to the big picture to comment upon both your introductory remark about the uh, domestic um, uh, resources that are being generated sometimes by uh, the ability to, to issue their own bonds sometimes. Uh, and, and then hopefully that is in improving the economy and that is allowing governments to increasingly enact uh, better tax administration policies so that they are you know, now resourced in a way that they can uh, increasingly, even in the lower income countries, resolve some of the most pressing uh, domestic social needs with resources that they themselves generate. And so increasingly, when they want to partner with development institutions uh, like those of my panelists here and, and OPIC, uh, they want to use those funds to really uh, generate uh, jobs for the local economy. And so I think that is a really important thing that they recognize they continue to need the partnership of both the private sector and uh, the development finance institutions to do that. And what it, what it means for us is exactly what, what Julie was saying. We've got to look at how do we scale uh, what we are able to do sufficiently to meet that increasing challenge. How do we make sure we've got internal capacity uh, to do that at a level uh, that is sufficient for the task that's ahead? And then also, how do we make sure that institutionally we have the willingness and the ability to innovate to meet the needs that as they are evolving? And so I think, you know, right now, today, it's a mixed bag, I think, for all of us. Um, scale is a problem. You've just, you've just heard the discussion on the multilaterals that have to uh, be, be focused on their rating and what the capital adequacy standards need to be to maintain that high-level rating so they can go out in the market and raise uh, funds. And, and I think on the OPIC side of the equation, we have a little bit of a different situation that equally constrains us. And that is um, really, it's, it's a budgetary one that is rooted in, in sort of uh, the, the politics of, of uh, lowering the budget overall uh, without a recognition for the fact that as a self-sustaining agency and the fact that we are able to engage in political risk insurance and financing and do so at uh, a profit in terms of earning a net contribution back to the US taxpayer, in, in effect, we could scale up without any net cost uh, to the, the federal government and, and, and continue to make the kind of deficit reduction contribution that we have for the last 40 years, year in and year out. And so we have a statutory ceiling that allows us to go to $29 billion. We're only at 18 today. We've got $11 uh, billion of running room, and what we're constrained by is staff, quite frankly. It's the, it's the throughput ability, the people to uh, process the transactions, to do the diligence, to monitor them for all the safeguards that need to be in place. And so I think, you know, for us it's a slightly different equation, but the capacity issue is one that we can't ignore um, and for all of the institutions. And as, as Julie also said, 
uh, in many of the, the tough markets that we're in, uh, the private sector does uh, need and want our involvement, and host country governments want us as, as partners. So, you know, we, we have a fix, we think, in terms of uh, the ability to scale. We need some willingness on all sides uh, from a budgetary standpoint to allow us to use more of the re revenues that we generate year in and year out to uh, uh, employ the staff that will allow us to reach the, the full capacity that, that Congress has given us of $29 billion. So then the question is, you know, what, what are we doing in terms of the, you know, flexibility and willingness to innovate so that, that we can be, continue uh, our relevance um, as the world is easy, as evolving. So, so let me start uh, by talking a little bit about geographies. Through, throughout OPIC's history, I think we have been a little bit of a first responder in unstable geographies, quite frankly, places where there's been transition, really going back to the dawn of OPIC uh, as part of the Marshall Plan. We were there on the front lines as, as countries were transitioning you know, economically and increasingly today as they're transitioning politically and as they are recovering from conflict. And so we have very conservatively looked at our portfolio and estimated that at least a third is in either is in unstable geographies, conflict affected, uh, post-conflict, uh, places where transitions are going on that are, are you know, very uh, positive from a U.S. foreign policy standpoint and ones we hope will turn positive if we can engage appropriately in terms of, of helping on the developmental side of that equation. So whether it's Afghanistan, uh, the Middle East and, and North Africa, uh, what's happening you know, uh, in Ukraine today, what happened in, in, in Georgia, we've been in all of those environments and we've been doing it by partnering with local private sector and US private sector companies to create the kind of economic development that creates jobs and moves economies forward. If you move away from geographies and begin to look at sectors, there are a couple that I would highlight. Certainly, the Electrify Africa, Power Africa initiative has put us very squarely, very, very focused on renewable energy in Africa, but all types of energy in Africa. Uh, that's been a, a, a very big effort on our part. And we're now looking beyond renewable energy to renewable resources as a whole and looking at the whole agribusiness value chain, both the very small, the very large, how, how do we play an effective role? Because food security is another important uh, agenda item uh, for the development agenda overall. And then moving to sort of the smaller scale of things, but I think <coughs> equally important, is how do we address the new interest in investing for true impact? How do we take some of the sectors that have been viewed as totally social and not having an economic sustainable model that works and turn those into private sector opportunities that do have a sustainable path? So we've got a couple of pilots. One is called investing is the portfolio for impact, investing for impact. We call it PI. And we, we've created a two-year pilot with a, a, a sum of money that we're willing to put into some pretty early stage, fairly high risk, uh, cutting edge type projects that have a very specific objective of a tackling a particular social uh, or environmental problem or issue. And we've, we've had some great success with that. One of the other things that we have recognized is that because of our staff constraints, we really have to work with intermediaries. They have to be our eyes and ears on the ground. We do not have a large staff in the field, just a few people scattered across the globe. And so we need local um, organizations or international organizations with local presence who can play that role for us. And we also have, you know, we've done it traditionally working with commercial banks, uh, microfinance institutions, uh, traditional investment funds. But we recognize that if we want to reach the small and medium enterprise sector, which is where a lot of job growth is going to come in these emerging markets, you need a different kind of intermediary. You need some hybrids. You need some non-bank finance institutions. You need some factoring companies, some leasing companies, some fund structures that don't look like the traditional private equity fund that we're familiar with. That means you're going a little further on the risk curve. You're doing things, you're shaking things up. You're looking at things in a slightly different way. But it's the kind of innovation that we need to do to make sure that we're going to hit all of all of the milestones um, and, and all of the, the, this, the huge range of size on this spectrum that we need to in terms of private sector development. And then finally, um, we, we've created something we call aligned capital. 
which, because we do not have the ability to take equity directly into funds or into the individual companies, we don't have a, a grant uh, uh, source or function internally at OPIC, so we need to align with, with people who have those resources. So we, we've set up a mechanism to try to match applicants for OPIC lending with either commercial sources or philanthropic sources who want to be involved in a particular geography or sector. And we hope to play a matchmaking role to provide the sort of capital either, whether it's <coughs> equity, first loss capital, side-by-side -side <coughs> capital that can help us leverage the debt products that, that OPIC has and, and achieve um, our overall developmental objectives. So I think, you know, having, having been on the investment practitioner side of, of this for the last 10 years at Small Enterprise Assistance Funds and now moving back into the government sector, I've really seen this uh, from both, both sides. And I think, you know, everything that all of us are, are doing, whether in the private sector or the, the public sector, um, you know, really, really calls out for strong uh, development institutions who can provide the financing that's needed to be out there on the cutting edge of, of these markets and also to be working very closely with our, with our local uh, counterparts. So I think we need to be um, aggressive and innovative in, in tackling the challenges that are ahead of us, but, but humble enough to keep learning and particularly to keep learning from our partners on the ground who um, are even more invested in the success of what we're about than, than all of us are up here. And we should never forget that, that it, this is, you know, this is about uh, reaching a point where those domestic flows really make what we all do much less necessary. Um, and, and I think that's, uh, that's what, you know, we've been tackling and, and, and making an effort to make some progress. Great. Thanks, Mildred. Um, Edie, you're at MEGA. You have a work on investment guarantees there. Um, how have you seen your client demand shift over time um, as these financial flows have changed? Do you still think in this day and age that there's a need for the type of guarantees that an entity like MEGA provides? Thanks, Connor. Well, there is an advantage to going last, <laughs> as I've uh, heard some uh, very interesting comments already made by, by my panelists, and as, as I listened to them, I was thinking you know, we, all, we all share this common challenge, which is how do we as a development finance community mobilize trillions of dollars, whatever number it is, the two or the nine, um, to developing countries and emerging markets if we're going to meet these uh, SDG goals of the post-2015 agenda. So we're all, I think, you know, facing that challenge. I also spent, you know, my weekend um, at the World Bank uh, spring meetings, meeting with ministers of finance from many developing countries. Many of them are very, very poor countries, um, uh, particularly in Africa. And again and again, the theme is private sector, private sector, private sector. How do we get more into our country? The private sector is the engine of growth, creates 90% of most jobs in these countries. And so the question is, you know, how, how do we do that? Um, I think there's a challenge, though, because there's quite a bit of money out there. Um, but there's, I think, still very limited risk appetite in the private <coughs> sector uh, to take on some of these uh, projects, particularly, um, again, in the poorest countries where the needs are just huge for infrastructure, uh, energy, et cetera. Um, to answer your question, I, I think if you look at what's happening globally, we're clearly in a very, very uncertain time. We are in, a, in, a, in a, an environment of heightened political risk. Um, you have the situation in Ukraine and Russia, which is a continued concern for, for many of, of, of us, and, and particularly private investors. Um, you've got, if you look at Africa, you've got the threat of Boko Haram, which is very, very serious threat uh, to, to West Africa in particular. If you look to East Africa, you have an increased, um, obviously, risk of terrorism, an overall increased um, influence of non-state actors and increased uh, terrorist risks um, globally. Um, you bring up the question of Iran, for example, you know, what's, what's going to be the impact if there is a deal on Iran, but more importantly, what's going to be the impact if there is no deal, uh, no nuclear deal um, uh, with Iran. Venezuela continues to be a situation that deteriorates. So again, you know, overall, I think there is a heightened degree of risk. I think um, investors are very, very concerned about how to mitigate and, and manage those risks. So where we sit at MEGA, which is part of the World Bank, and our role is to provide political risk guarantees to get investors to go into these challenging markets, we absolutely see um, increased demand um, for, for those products. It's interesting because I've been in this business for about 25 years now, and I remember a time about 10 years ago 
where many people were saying, oh, nobody's going to need political risk insurance anymore. You know, they're, they're, it's a dying product, you know, not, not going to be needed. Well, absolutely not. I mean, we've seen how um, more and more investors um, need these kinds of products um, to go anywhere outside of their home country. Um, we've seen particularly uh, increased demand in the uh, international banking market from the international uh, commercial banks with uh, the impact of Basel regulations and EU regulations. The commercial banks are very constrained in what they can do. Um, they're very limited in terms of long-term lending and there many of the banks are reducing their assets and reducing their risk tolerances. So uh, again, where we sit at MEGA, that's been an, I think a, a, an interesting shift in terms of our business. Many, many of the banks now are seeking um, some kind of guarantee, either a political risk guarantee or increasingly what we call a comprehensive form of guarantee that will give them full regulatory relief under Basel or, or, or similar uh, regulations. We're also seeing a, an interesting trend, which is new players in this market. Um, it's no longer just investors from the US or from Europe. We're seeing new players in the emerging markets who are also now investors. Not surprisingly, if you look at overall uh, trends in FDI, an increasing share of FDI flows are coming from the developing countries themselves, no longer from the developed world. So at MIGA, we now have clients from South Africa, for example, South African banks, very, very active now in project <coughs> finance, lending to projects in the sub-Saharan African region. Not only South African banks, though, South African corporates, also now going into neighboring countries. We're seeing investors from Turkey, for example, clients of MIGA, we're guaranteeing their investments in the Middle East region, doing projects in Iraq uh, and elsewhere in the region. Um, we've seen uh, investors now from India, for example, also clients of ours who are now more active uh, in the neighboring Asian countries uh, and increasingly outside of, uh, outside of Asia. Um, at Brazil, for example, again, uh, very, very active now in, in, in Africa and those kinds of trends. So we're seeing not only increased demand overall, we're seeing uh, shifts in terms of the, the types of investors that we're seeing. We've also had to innovate um, as well to be responsive to um, these shifts and to the, to the increased demand for more comprehensive covers. Um, one of the things we've done at MIGA is develop a new product that we call non-honoring of sovereign financial obligation product. So unlike our political risk products, this is a, a real credit enhancement product which allows us to guarantee long-term financing where you've got a government that's going out to finance a, a large infrastructure project and MIGA can help bring uh, better tenors, better terms uh, for those types of projects. This puts us a bit more into the, into the public sector range and we're now able to support more PPP projects um, and large uh, energy and infrastructure projects. One last point, which is that I, I think another um, trend that we see and when we talk to investors is the increased um, concern about non-political risks. Uh, and by this I mean things like social risks when they're doing projects um, in the emerging markets, security risks, um, resettlement issues, land acquisition issues. So a whole host of risks which are not political risks or you can't find an insurance product or you can't find a guarantee product to mitigate those risks. Those are the things that I think investors worry about. You know, how, how do they deal with armed forces you know, that may be either on the project site or, or, or nearby the project site? You know, how do they deal with the potential for NGOs, domestic NGOs, protesting against their project, community engagement, um, and those kinds of things? And so I think, again, I think collectively, you know, we, we need to keep working on you know, what, what's the best approach uh, to deal with those types of issues so we can successfully bring more private sector investment and financing uh, to the developing world. Thanks, Edie, that's great. Um, I only want to ask a couple of quick follow-ups and then I think we really want to open it up to the audience for their questions. Um, one of the first ones I want to ask, though, is uh, from, clearly what we've heard today is that there is a demand for the products that OPIC is offering, Omega, IDB, there's a clear demand here. But one of the things that you often hear as a criticism is that entities like this crowd out uh, private sector investment. And I know Mildred OPIC deals with that quite a bit um, on the congressional, um, with some of the congressional opposition here. What do you all say to that? Is this, is this what's actually happening? Or is this really just a, something that's ginned up because people don't like what you're doing? Maybe we'll start with Mildred on yeah. this one. Well, I, look, I think you know none of us would, would be here but for the private sector, right? We cannot do this alone. We are not authorized to, to do this alone. Certainly we are not. 
we can only facilitate private sector flows. And we work very closely with any uh, commercial banks that are willing to take the risks in these, these markets. And we often will use our products on the public risk side or otherwise to you know, work alongside bondholders and others. So to, to me, it's a very collaborative, uh, synergistic partnership that allows each of us to do things that we could not mm -hmm. do alone. And it, it, we just don't live in a black and white either or world. We, we need all the tools. And I yeah. think you know, we're all continuing to innovate to make sure that the way we apply them yeah. is as effective as, as possible. And, and the last thing in the world, given the challenges that are ahead of us that we want to do, is crowd anyone out of how, helping us solve the challenges that are right. ahead of us. Right. Julie? So, so I would say that there was probably a time in the past where some of that was true. Mm -hmm. and, and I can recall when I first took the job as the EVP of the bank, where particularly on the financial institution side, someone came and said, no, no, we need to do X because Citibank will do it. They wished they hadn't said that because they left my office with, okay, that's good, we shouldn't be in that loan. And that is very clearly what everybody understands today. Our business is crowding in, not crowding out. And, and you know, just, to, to answer that and also pick up this question of risks and perceived risks, project finance is a fascinating business. You know, we all know intuitively that when you do a project financing, things are probably more secure than if you do a corporate lending um, operation. But people hadn't studied it particularly well. And Moody's recently did, last month, did this huge study of 61% of all the project financings between 1983 and 2013, right? It's like, a, I think it's $5 trillion, 5,300 loans and public financings. And a couple of really interesting things came out of that. And I, I mention this because I think this is part of our job in terms of how to crowd in, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's being there, but it's also conveying the kinds of knowledge that will convince people to do things that today they think are too risky. And that's why if you look at project financings worldwide, only 2% of the money comes from pension funds and insurance companies. And if we want to get to these kinds of numbers, that number cannot be 2%, right? Okay, so 5,300, $5 trillion. Out of that 5,300, only 380 defaulted. And of that, two-thirds of them actually, after they defaulted, paid back 100% of the money that they borrowed. And of the one-third that didn't, the ones that defaulted post-construction paid back over 80%. The ones that defaulted either at the start of construction paid, up, paid back 70%. And fascinatingly, so then the default rate is like 6.5%. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the subset of PPPs, it's a small subset, though. It's 3.5%. And here's just one last piece of fascinating information, OECD versus non-OECD. Almost indistinguishable. So the default rate, instead of being like six and a half-ish, is a little over seven. The, the recovery when they default is identical. It's actually slightly higher, 1% higher in the non-OECD countries. And the period of time it takes to emerge from default, two years in the OECD countries, 2.9 years in the non-OECD countries. Right. Okay, so if I put 10 institutional investments in, investors in the room, there is not a chance that any one of them would get anywhere close to knowing that the risk in those two markets is actually so similar and that the numbers are what they are. So, you know, there is massive potential to crowd those guys in. And it's, it's people, I think, like us who have to take both knowledge and instruments to do that crowding in. Great, thanks, Charles. Charles, you're our sole private sector representative on the panel. What do you, do you what's your view on well, this Well, it's issue? funny because I, uh, Julie mentioned that People used to complain about it more, and I used to complain about it a lot, but because the private sector is very self-serving, right? I mean, the whole point of private sector is to create the optimal conditions to make a profit, frankly, and so they will complain about it more. I think there is a real place for all three organizations, and the reality is that what my investors will invest in is quite conservative, and they are not willing to go out on a limb, and the credibility and the expertise that these organizations bring is valuable to us because at the end of the day, we tend to be a lot less brave than we pretend to be. Uh, no one wants to get into a situation where the likelihood of default is 10%. So um, there always is going to be
a place for you know, public sector, but it has to be the, you know, the, the, the tip of the spear. And there's always going to be a place for the private sector. And what's happened is that the balance has, has shifted back and forth. Right now, we have so much money coming in, as you pointed out earlier, that it's very easy not to complain because we have yeah. so many other things to do. But, but when that market begins to leave our markets, when that money begins to leave our markets yeah. again, our space is going to shrink and theirs is going to grow again mm -hmm. because anything that we would consider marginal today, but we still do, will no longer be acceptable <coughs> to the investor base. And so it's not, there is, you're always going to hear whining about uh, crowding out, but the reality is it's more self-serving than yeah. it is, uh, I think, a legitimate concern mm -hmm. for, the, for the investment community. Very good. Edie, do you have a... I would tend to agree with, with everything yeah. that's been said. I think it used to be an argument. I think it's kind of an old argument now. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't hear it much uh, at MEGA these days. We're also crowding in the private sector. We take that role very seriously. I mean, we, we, we really want to complement and, and, and fill gaps and not compete with, with the private sector. Um, one of the things we do is we uh, reinsure quite a bit of our exposure. So MEGA has a $12 billion portfolio with about a billion dollars of capital. I mean, how do we do that? We do that by leveraging the private market behind us on transactions uh, where we're involved. So for example, last year, we did a very large project in Angola. It was a large hydro uh, power project. We provided a guarantee covering private financing to the project. It was a 12-year guarantee. Um, we issued a guarantee of $600 million, but we only kept about $200 million on our balance sheet. So we were able to bring in $400 million of private insurance capacity behind us for a transaction in Angola that the private market would not have done without MIGA's involvement. So that's very much our role. How do we bring in more private insurance and private players behind us in support of transactions that they wouldn't do otherwise? Quite honestly, if the private market can do it, they're generally going to be faster. <laughs> they're generally going to be a little bit cheaper. So it, it tends to work itself out anyways. Yeah. Um, and I also think that, that the needs are so great and the projects are getting so big that there's a role for everyone. Um, and that's another trend we're seeing, these projects where you really need multi-sourcing yes. and you need yeah. private public sector blends as well. Uh, last year we did a, a very interesting transaction in Brazil where we used a non-honoring product to guarantee a financing for the state of Sao Paulo alongside an IBRD loan to the state uh, for a large uh, transport project. Why did we do that? Because Brazil had limited resources in terms of what it can borrow from the World Bank, so it wanted to leverage those resources by bringing in private sector financing with MEGA. So we're seeing very interesting um, uh, structures, uh, mechanisms where you really need private and public sector, and I think there's room for all of us. I think the competitive argument is quite honestly yeah. um, uh, an old one, and, and I'm not, yeah. not too concerned about it. Julie, you had a follow-up? Yeah, I just want to, to, to pick up on this and just give one other example, because I think it's, it's not only sort of our resources, but things that countries are doing in a really creative way as well. Um, so we, we're obviously very active in climate change and renewables, and um, the Canadians, as part of the Copenhagen round, gave us $250 million of the fast start money. Um, and we call it the Canadian Climate Fund. And that money has now been leveraged seven to one in the projects that we've done, right? Wow. And I'll just give one example, which is that it's solar, and you, you know, it's the question of how brave, right? So <laughs> solar in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Okay, so you're really clear the sun's going to be there. <laughs> but yet, right, but yet, <laughs> This was using solar to power drip irrigation for fruit for export. But it hadn't been done. And so there weren't commercial banks who were willing to do it. And the, the returns on the equity, if we hadn't been able to put some subsidized money in there, then the banks wouldn't have lent and the, and the equity couldn't have <laughs> the return it needed. Mm -hmm. So by putting in a slug of what, what the Canadian Climate Fund money is, which is we use it as subordinated debt with a very low return. So it's reimbursable, but it's got a subsidized return in it. Let the equity happen, let the debt happen. We lent a couple hundred million dollars. Other banks came in for a couple hundred million dollars. There's a hundred million dollars of equity. So, you know, it, it's taking all these pieces and putting yeah. it together, I think, that's really critical. Yeah. Thank you. I think given the time, we'll go to the audience now and try to get some questions. Um, we have Mike. So. They will come to you. Uh, just identify yourself, and please keep your questions short and the commentary shorter. Uh, so this gentleman right here in the middle third row, and I'm going to bundle these. 
take uh, two or three at a time. And then this gentleman back here. Go ahead, sir. Hi. Uh, my name is Prem. I am a uh, development professional from Pakistan. Uh, I was uh, hearing we talked about some challenges regarding security, challenges regarding the political and non-political. Uh, I just wanted to uh, highlight another uh, challenge or another area of potential as well, that when we talk about the small or medium uh, landing or small or medium sector enterprises, uh, how much we put the emphasis on the uh, capacity building of that uh, entrepreneur. Like, okay, we are providing the investment, we are providing the money, but uh, on the other hand, the non-financial aspect, like the capacity building of that entrepreneur, so that he or she can able to make the money and can return, so that can actually, so how you see that perspective, one. And then how we also influence the government to, uh, to increase the taxation, for example, like, uh, like there are less than 2% people who pay the tax, and then there are like uh, more than 40% who are in the fourth or the last quintile of the economic uh, status. So how we influence the government to increase like the tax reforms or increase the GDP share on the education or the economic development instead of the military or the uh, non-development expenses. Thank you, sir. Uh, and then this gentleman back here. Greetings, I'm Thomas Ford. I'm a former economist at the World Bank. Um, and a P3 specialist, and I think that's a key thing we need to be talking about is how do P3 works, what are the difference between a P3 versus project financing. Project financing is very short-term thinking, P3 is long-term thinking. And what was interesting, I was at the World Bank meetings this last week, and the big discussions going on is the new bank that's coming into play, the AIIB. And how is that playing into the trade issue? How does that play also? You had um, a good discussion here on um, the Import-Export Bank. Yep. And so how do the 59 different agencies that are around the world affecting all this? Thank you. So we go to the panel. I think we had a question on how do you build the capacity of entrepreneurs beyond just providing them financing, and how do you influence uh, governments to make the needed investments around social issues or education and things like that. Um, and then this was a long-term, short-term P3 versus project finance. So maybe we'll start with Mildred. I, I think that the one of those that I can you know, yeah. talk to, I think, is the capacity building for SMEs and, and just acknowledge uh, with you just how critical that is. I spent the last 10 years of my life working uh, with SMEs you know, throughout the emerging markets, and I know full well that without adequate capacity building, and it usually means you know, some fine type of grant uh, technical assistance, it's uh, often challenging then to lend to such a company or invest equity with such a company and expect to get a return if you haven't built up that capacity. And quite frankly, today, you know, they're not often good options. I think, you know, I, I'll be interested in Julie's comment because I know they do have the capacity um, and the, the facility to, to join those two together, and it's so critical, but so many of our uh, DFIs are, are quite frankly siloed in that respect, and they have lending programs, but they don't necessarily have a companion technical assistance capability that they can, you know, jointly uh, provide, and I think that what it is what's so important. So I think the more that um, our organizations can work together, the more that OPIC can pair up with USAID or Millennium Challenge Corporation that has the grant capability, the, the, you know, the, the more effective it's going to, to be for the downstream SMEs. We have done this in the renewable energy sector with our uh, Africa Clean Energy Program where, where state and USAID have cooperated with us so that we can provide some technical assistance funding alongside. But I agree with you, it's, it's absolutely critical to, to success in, this, in that sector. Julie, did you want to um, jump in on that? I'll say, uh-huh. I mean, I, in the interest of time, you know, I agree with that we are in a great position in that regard. We do have a, a grant arm that can invest to not only build capacity of individual entrepreneurs, but also through our sovereign guaranteed side to work with countries to fix the enabling environment that entrepreneurs face. You know, I, how, how long it takes to get licenses and establish your business and all of those small things which at the end of the day add up. So I think it's coming at it from all angles, and then the access to finance piece as well, which you're right, is not enough if, if people don't have a way to improve their capacity. Um, I would just say on the domestic resource mobilization um, piece, yeah, you know, we work very hard on 
addressing tax administration, tax reform, and now the, the quality of spending for the revenues that are there. And in our region, there's a seven percentage point gap between the OECD and our region in the percent of GDP that is collected. And you, you obviously have to go after that. And, and a lot of countries in our region are very focused on that today because they're looking at their fiscal accounts and saying, huh, when things were great, I spent a lot more on the social side. Now things are not great. And if I am going to continue to keep up that spending without putting my rating and my access to finance and the international markets at risk, I have to increase my revenue base. And so there's a lot of focus there. Um, I would just say on the, the, the um, I'll just take the AIIB part mm. of this. You know, I said earlier that there's a bit of a mismatch between the ambition as captured by the SDGs and the financial capacity of these institutions. Yep. There's also a, somewhat of a mismatch between ambition and the governance of these institutions. And I think that the AIIB is actually a good catalyst for the countries that have invested so heavily over the last 60 years in the multilateral development system to look carefully and say, where is it that we can, while doing what is right, improve the efficiency, agility, flexibility, and speed of these institutions? Because if that does not happen, then I think 10 years from now, there'll be a people representing different institutions sitting right here. And our creation of NUCO is a piece of this because mm -hmm. we have used it and are using it to look wholesale at processes and say, how do we become more agile and fast? But it has to happen systemically across yeah. the institution. Charles, do you have a view on any of these? Or? Well, um, the only thing I'd say is there is an increasing social awareness in the investor community. And there are a series of products that are now being developed that are targeted at, and we're talking large sums, right? 200, 300 billion dollars, for example, largely out of Europe at this point, but increasingly out of the US, targeted toward social responsible investment. And obviously all of that can be used efficiently and channeled efficiently into micro lending and so <laughs> forth. But, but I think it's more a question for the, yeah. the other three panelists. Edie. Um, just on the point about, you know, how do we influence governments in terms of some of these other issues, I just wanted to say that um, that's not really MIGA's role, but certainly the World Bank and the new way that the World Bank has been organized, I think it's going to go a long way to address some of those issues. So the, the new structure at the World Bank are these 13 global practices, and the whole idea is how do you take this global knowledge that the World Bank has and deliver it locally uh, to, to respond to the needs of, of our clients. And so there's a global practice, for example, for, for education. And the idea is to take that knowledge and that expertise that we have and deliver it where, where it's needed. So I think some of these issues, tax reform, mm -hmm. uh, governance, um, you know, social housing, education, et cetera, I think are very much aligned with the, with the new structure at the World Bank. Um, I agree also project finance P3, it's what we should be talking about more, more P3, although I would caution, though, again, there, I think there's a bit of an expectation gap there as well. I mean, a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on uh, P3 and PPPs in terms of being the panacea for, for everything, and not always. It's, it's, these are, these are uh, they take a lot of capacity, they take a long time, it can sometimes be uh, very difficult to structure and put together, so it, I think it depends very much on the, on the context. Okay. Other questions? Uh, this gentleman in the back over here, and we'll take this gentleman up here, and then we'll get to these other folks next. Yes, hello. I'm Pat Korowski. I'm a way back a, a World Bank executive director about 10 years ago. Right now, the banks are allowed to hold much less equity when they lend to something perceived as safe than when they lend to something perceived as risky which means that the banks make much higher risk-adjusted returns on their equity when lending what's safe than when lending to what's risky. And that distorts the allocation of bank credit. And for little purpose, because what's risky has never been a, a detonant of major bank crisis. It's always been something perceived as safe that turns out to be risky. But if you really want to push sustainable development goals, then go to the bank regulators and ask them to have the SDGs weighted equity requirement for banks. So that banks, when they do that, they can have a little bit less equity and they make better risk adjusted returns. That is the way you treat the incentives. Give some purpose back to the banks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, this gentleman right up here in the front. 
Thank you, um, Akbar Faria, former World Bank official. Uh, thanks, Mildred, uh, about your comments on OPEC. Uh, if you could comment on OPEC portfolio size and how big is your team to support it, and also if you could include uh, who are the major beneficiary sectors in the countries. Thank you. And then let's take one more, this gentleman right here. Hi, Dave Ramaswamy, Africa Agribusiness Magazine. How do you quantify environmental, social, and governance risks on projects? Uh, what, and what have you learned from failures in failing to quantify these risks? And going forward, there are other players in the development arena, like China, Brazil, and India. How do we ensure that MDB's financing of projects, specifically in agriculture, piggybacks on some of the investment being done by these other country players and institutions. Thank you. Thanks very much. So, Mildred, maybe you can make a brief comment on the question about yeah. OPIC's portfolio yeah. size, and then we can go to these other sure, ones. Sure, sure. So, so OPIC's portfolio today is about $18 billion, and as I mentioned earlier, we actually have uh, statutory authority <coughs> to go up to $29 billion, and we are you know, fortunate in the sense that, that because we are not raising money in the public markets, we, we don't have the same uh, constraint in terms of the, the rating agency, but obviously we, we keep a sound portfolio. Our, our loss rate is less than 1% um, on an annual uh, basis net of recoveries. Uh, in terms of how our portfolio is um, arrayed, uh, we are, are the majority of our portfolio today, or the largest portion of our portfolio today, is uh, still in, in Latin America uh, and Central America, so it's, uh, you know, it's that region that is the largest part of our portfolio, but Africa is a significant share as well. And then, you know, earlier in OPEC's uh, history, it had done quite a lot in, uh, in, in Central and Eastern Europe, but much of that portfolio has paid off um, over time. And, and then we are increasing our focus on Asia. And, and in terms of sectors, uh, clearly in, in recent years, the renewable energy sector is, has taken a big leap forward. Uh, we've done some, some very major, you know, $250 million, you know, exposures for OPEC and even much larger, you know, wind and solar projects throughout uh, Africa. So that, that, is, that is, is strong uh, for us. But, you know, on the SME side, we're doing sort of bread and butter, you know, manufacturing and services type companies. So we're, we're arrayed globally, and I think sectorally we're pretty balanced as, as well. And we have a, you know, a good track record in, in terms of uh, recoveries. But I, you know, I would agree with the other gentleman that I think we've always got to keep our eye on the fact that um, our job is to be cutting edge. Our job is to take on, you know, risks that others aren't ready to take. And so, you know, we've been spending a lot of time making sure we understand our portfolio as well as we can so that we can, um, you know, understand what those drivers are and be more able to take the kind of risks that we know as a development institution we need to take. Um, so, thanks, Mildred. Uh, just in terms of these other questions, how do you quantify, how do we quantify ESG? Um, how do we ensure that the MDBs, they're, the investments they're making are somewhat in tandem with the ones that BRIC countries are making? And then this uh, comments around risk appetite and how that's driving achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals or, or may not drive achievement of the Sustainable De Development Goals. So what is the risk appetite for the MDBs and are they trying to make riskier or make less safe investments, shall we say? Uh, Julian Eady, maybe you can comment on that? Sure. So. so I'll, I'll start with the questions about sustainability broadly, as I'll, as I'll put it. And that I think most of the MDBs have taken up until now an approach that is uh, make sure we don't do the harm that had been done in a, in a previous era by not taking things into account. So that's a safeguards approach that says, look, have a resettlement policy and make sure you're doing the right thing and, and various environmental policies. But I, I think, at least for our institution, we are in the process of taking another look at that and saying, how do we have more of a sustainability approach? How do we take something like the Better Growth, Better Climate Report, which now for the first time says, in fact, you can have it all. Um, you know, countries can grow sustainably and have less of an impact on the climate, on the, on the, on the planet. Um, recognizing that there are intertemporal problems between haves and have-nots and, and winners and losers, and, and think about how we convey that message and how we think of this as not only what are the problems, but what are the opportunities. 
And what we think that means is we have to rethink businesses like the infrastructure business to go earlier in the value chain of the thinking of the projects so that you're actually thinking about the opportunities and avoiding from the get-go the problems. And that relates to things like, someone said earlier, you know, communities who, who may not be displaced but are not happy with the way things are being done or agricultural projects that might not be terrible for the environment, but there might be better things to do or better ways to do them. And if you were part of the conversation earlier on, then you could think it through that way. Um, just tying it to the part of, of tying in with what the BRICS and others are doing. You know, I think um, all of the institutions work harder today. We, we, we program what we're going to do with our counterparts in the country. And we work hard during that piece of things to make sure we know what's happening in the countries. And so if it's agriculture and it's Brazil, we spend a lot of time with Embrapa to make sure that we're thinking about what they are doing and how they can be important counterparts for us and how that also translates to the Africa Development Bank and to Africa as a whole because they're active there through what are new South-South foreign development organizations mm -hmm. in the Global South. So I think that the dialogue has changed quite dramatically and we're really conscious of being a part of that in a very positive way. Edie, did you have a view on this, the risk yeah, side of things? Yeah, it's an interesting, very interesting question on, on ESG risks and, yeah. I, and I think um, from the private sector's perspective, um, there's a growing awareness obviously of, of these issues. Um, but I think a lot of private sector companies are, are grappling with how, exactly this. How do they quantify these risks and how do they build them into their financial models and, and business models, uh, what have you. I was, last week was in New York at a round table and talking to um, a woman who's head of sustainability for one of a major oil, oil and gas company, U.S. oil and gas company. And you, know, you, you, you can imagine 10 years ago it didn't even exist you know, in their, in their uh, corporate structure. Now it's, it, it's, it's a formal responsibility, but she spends you know, every day talking to engineers and, and about, you know, you've got you've to pay attention to these things. You've got to pay attention to the local communities where you're doing a project. You have to, you know, you have to have stakeholder engagement and what have you, what have you. But all they want is just put it in a spreadsheet and give me a, you know, give me a way to, to quantify this. What, what is the cost to my business if I don't do this, if I do do this? I think there's a need for something like this, at least in the private sector. I, I, I think it's a very, very interesting question. Um, I think we will continue to see more focus on this. Um, as I said earlier, uh, the, these non-political risks, these risks that cannot be mitigated, you can't purchase an insurance product to cover these. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of private sector companies are, are trying to figure that out. So it's, a, it's an interesting question. I'm not sure I have a, a, a good answer for you, but I think it's something that we will, we will hear more about. Um, I also just want to say I think the comment on regulation is, is right on uh, what you said. I agree with it. Either we need to change the regulations or we're going to need to have new uh, non-bank players that are going to be willing to go into these markets. The commercial banks are just not able to do it anymore. They're, 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 I mean, they're really withdrawing from this market. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's, that's, that's a challenge. You forgot the failure yeah. part. Oh, yeah. Did you want to talk? Yeah, because it's a really important point. The failure yeah, the part failure of your part. question, and I forgot. Uh, so. <laughs> You know, I, I came from the private sector when I, when I came to the IDB, and, and one of the fascinating things in these organizations is really no one wants to use that word. So we have something called the Development Effectiveness Overview every year, and two years ago I said, okay, so we're going to have a section on failure. And I got back the first draft of the section on failure, and it never used the word failure. <laughs> literally. Literally. And because everyone wanted to call it lessons learned. I'm like, mm, you see, by not using the word failure, I promise you, we're not talking about failure, and we weren't. And it was a fascinating thing because although the countries, when they have their, their investor, donor, shareholder hat on, say, you need to learn from failure. If the failure happened in their country, they don't want to talk about failure anymore. So there are all of these cross currents that make learning from failure a little bit hard. And it means that you have to really invest in freeing people to use the word. And we brought fail forward into the organization. We devote time to people talking about failure. I'm hosting an event in a week with our directors on problems in, 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 in projects, what failed and how we learned from it. This year's section on failure uses the word <coughs> failure. Um, but it's <laughs> such a struggle to make it happen with the teams. It's unbelievable. So it's not easy. But we think that we're doing a better job of actually looking at failures as failures than saying, why did we learn from them? What did we learn from them? And let's just not repeat them. Yeah. 
And, and I think just to just to add one one counterpoint to that is just that I think in in the development finance world, failure has often been synonymous with we never got the loan repaid. But I think you know now the the discussion is so much broader because failure isn't necessarily about whether we got the money back. It's you know did we achieve our developmental objective? Did some other unforeseen you know unfortunate things happen along the ways in terms in terms of local communities or whatnot? So I think the definition of failure is also been absolutely. Broader. Charles, maybe I'll give you the last word. Do you want to talk at all about how Morgan Stanley is approaching quantifying ESG or how you're looking at it? In terms of, I'm sorry, ESG is um, not environmental, familiar. social, and governance. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. 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 No, we're uh, trying very actively to become involved in that space, and we've led this whole uh, green bond initiative that I mentioned previously. So. Um, there is an enormous amount of socially conscious money. Uh, we're trying to channel it to uh, projects that, that meet the criteria that we're looking for and that, that investors are looking for. Because the reality is that the nature of investors has gone from being purely profit and loss to a more socially conscious uh, mindset as well. And, and that's a trend that we see growing very, very quickly throughout uh, globally and, and, and it's going to also make uh, environmental. I mean, environmental is already a very big consideration. We won't do anything that doesn't meet minimum environmental standards because it's bad business. And we've learned that even if a transaction is profitable, that it gets this negative publicity, it's bad business. And we learned that mm -hmm. in, in spades during the 2008 crisis when we realized how dependent we were on government institutions and on relationships with the government. So um, we have a, a, a new consciousness, I think, uh, with regard to that. And you know, that's one of many things we do, but, but that's one that I'm involved in. Thanks, Charles. I think uh, we're out of time here, so I want to thank all of you for joining me. This was a great discussion. Uh, great having all of you here. I think we had a, um, a very fruitful discussion. Uh, just very quickly for all of you, um, lunch is starting now. We're going to be doing lunch up here, uh, just in the back here. And there's also lunch available down on the concourse level, and there are folks who can direct you uh, to that. Uh, so please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you.